Hey, what's up, Rotor Grinders, and welcome to Sharp DFS Analysis here on rotorgrinders.com. My name is Chris Jamino. It's Black Friday. It's week number 12 in the NFL, and we are taking a look at the action on this weekend's slate from a Vegas and advanced analytics standpoint, and joining me to go over this information, we've got two of the very sharpest guys in the business. First, let's go to Warren Sharp of Sharp DFS Analysis, Sharp DFS analysis and uh, sharpfootballstats.com. Warren, what's happening? Hey, what's going on, guys? Hope everybody had a great and safe Thanksgiving and uh, looking forward to what Week 12 has in store for us. Warren, I butchered the website. It's sharpfootballanalysis.com. Check that stuff out. Really good information over there. And joining us from 4for4.com, the senior DFS editor, we've got Chris Raybon. Raybon, what's going on? What's up, man? Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Uh, let's get right into this, man. Yeah, man. You know, we had some action yesterday. A little unusual week when it comes to that every year on Thanksgiving. Uh, also unusual is the idea of taking a look at all this information we have on teams from a season-long perspective and trying to figure out how much of this information is still valid because this week one seems like it was like a, like a year ago at this point in time. We don't necessarily want to look at everything in a macro standpoint necessarily, Warren, because quite frankly, everything we've seen uh, from the beginning of the season might not apply to our analysis of the games coming up in week number 12. So w- let's talk about that, macro versus micro. How much of the information are you looking at uh, that's available from the start of the season? Are you hedging that in the last couple of weeks? Like, what is the best way to look at this information so that we can try to predict the flow of these games and the totals of these games? Yeah, I think I think it's an important time of the year to think about stuff like this. Um, more, so, you know, more so even like the next couple of weeks, but it's still important at this stage in the in the season, right after Thanksgiving as well. Uh, many of the teams now have uh, officially or will in the next week or two officially be eliminated from postseason contention. I'm sure we'll talk about some other angles that we can uh, capitalize on from that perspective. But, uh, you know, getting a sense as to what these teams are doing and how they're trending of late as opposed to, you know, what they did the first month of the season. Because inevitably you have coaching strategies that change or get modified. You have player injuries that are going to impact the way that, a defense or an offense can be even assembled on the football field, let alone execute things. So you have to take that into consideration. Um, and so while I still will look at year to date matchups, you know, this unit versus that unit, and I'll have my, you know, uh, special tables and things that I've built to easily study, you know, year long data. I've also built up at Sharp Football Stats a couple of trending models where we look at, you know, you can, the user can define by a scroll bar, what weeks they want to look at. And it will show you literally like what a team's success rate is for passes in the last three weeks versus the, the, you know, entire season. Uh, You could do the last four weeks, the last five weeks, however you want to set that trending up. It looks at passing success, rushing, rushing success, explosive passing and explosive rushing. I also have another visualization that I built up there that looks at weekly performance and trend lines where it literally shows you both from an offense and a defense perspective, what a team is doing in terms of a weekly success rate from passing, rushing, explosive passing, explosive rushing. And then you can compare that to the defense that they're going to face or look at the the team itself, offense and defense, to get a better understanding of how this team currently is trending and faring. I think all of those things, though, the one caveat I'll mention with regard to studying and focusing a lot on trending um, is you have to understand strength of schedule. And that's why I think it's very important to uh, cross-reference the information that you're getting out of the year long, uh, sorry, out of the trending numbers with what their schedule is that they've played the last few weeks compared to the earlier part in the season. And there's different tools up at the site that I've built that will allow you to do that as well. But regardless of what site you're on, I think, um, even if it's your own, you know, you're coming up with your own numbers from your own Excel spreadsheets or something, you have to understand that when you're reducing the sample size, it's one thing the NFL has a sample size problem to begin with. There's only 16 regular season games and we've broke down tons of analysis and had great weeks back in weeks three and four and five. And and we were only had like two to three weeks of of actual game data to start to process. You could still take things away from that, but you absolutely must start to account for strength of schedule when you're looking at what the trending uh, couple of weeks have done compared to the full season. Yeah, Chris, I completely agree. And when you hear, you know, analysts say, you know, such and such team has allowed, you know, X production to the X position, you know, a lot of this information is assuming that these teams are still the same teams when in reality injuries to key positions like middle linebacker, like safeties, like cornerbacks 
uh, can very much change the way they might give up production. So when you talk about, you know, are these teams who we thought they were, how do you go about trying to figure out who this team is right now as opposed to what the numbers have said this team has been for the whole season? Well, I think there's a, a few different ways, you know, starting with the, um, the, the, the fantasy points allowed to each position, you want to kind of think that through and say, okay, well, you know, I think schedule adjusted fantasy points allowed is a good place to start. But, you know, as you mentioned, that's kind of full season data. So from there, you kind of want to cross reference that. And what I like to do is just go right in and look at what a team has given up, you know, to each player each week, you know, starting with the week, the, the most current recent week and just going back and kind of looking at it and saying, okay, you know, is this repeatable? It, like, I try to find similar matchups as much as I can. So, you know, if there's a certain type of, maybe if it's a stud tight end, I look what they did to other stud tight ends, or if it's a number one option in the passing game, I look to see, you know, did they stop number other number one options in the passing game and things like that. You really just kind of want to uh, put yourself in the defensive coordinator's shoes a little bit and, and see, you know, what their plan was maybe coming into that game and, and, and whether they did that. So I think you can kind of, you can look at these uh, defense versus position numbers and they're going to have a lot of noise, especially when they're not adjusted for strength of schedule like we do at 4 for 4 So the ones on the fantasy sites, for example, I know DraftKings has it right there, FanDuel 2. Um, those are going to have noise. And what you want to do there is you want to be aware that – so I did a study and I looked at what are the correlations between just regular unadjusted fantasy points allowed to position – um, you know, from week to week during the season. So, for example, you know, how correlated is it after two games, after three games, after four games to the next game's uh, production allowed? And there's hardly any correlation. And it's, it pales in comparison to the offensive play, just the offensive players' uh, season averages. So if you just look at, like, for example, a running back's points per game, during the season, you know, as the sample grows, that's going to get more predictive. Whereas if you're looking at the defense, it's, there's really not much correlation there. And I think we've talked about this before, but also remember that um, an offensive matchup for, for pretty much all the skill positions um, is going to come into play more just the, who that offensive player is and how good they are. It's probably about by a two to one ratio. Um, offense is going to kind of matter more than that matchup because defense is reactionary. But so you got to keep that in mind. Then you could look at Things like funnel ratings, for example, what we do at 4 for 4, we're just kind of showing where, what, where the production is being funneled for each defense. So sometimes a defense is, you know, good or bad versus every position. But so you want to kind of look at, well, OK, but, you know, is, is, is more than average or less than average production, you know, going to, let's see, the tight end versus the receivers or the quarterback versus the running back and things like that. You could cross-reference that. You could cross-reference um, schedule-adjusted fantasy points allowed with something like Warren's. Uh, success rates versus each position, which he has on uh, sharp football stats. And you can kind of see, you know, sometimes there's just a lot of noise in the data where maybe um, you'll see a team that is good in one metric and bad in the other. And then you kind of have to go back and make some sense out of that. So it really goes on a case by case basis. But as far as teams and not being who they thought they, we thought they were teams changing, I think it, it really just comes down to um, if injuries are going to be the biggest factor, I think a lot of times, but I also think that, um, you know, stepping back from the numbers a little bit sometimes and thinking about it just more on a, a straight up real football um, from a real football perspective, I find that it helps a lot. So when I'm not, you know, crunching numbers, a lot of times I'm doing things as simple as reading a team's local beat report or, you know, I like I like this podcast uh, Mike Lombardi and uh, Tate Frazier do over at the ringer called GM Street where Michael Lombardi, he's a former NFL GM and he, he, he gives a lot of just like football knowledge and football tips and one thing he said that I thought was important was he said for the first month of the season pretty much every team is in evaluation mode they're kind of uh, figuring out who they are they're figuring out what works and what doesn't they know they're probably not going to lose the season in, in the first month even if they go you know one and three or something like that so they're, they're, they're kind of in evaluation mode and then you got to get into October and November and December and it starts to be about, um, you know, what teams can execute when the defense knows they're coming. Because after about four weeks, everyone's watched, everyone's seen your tape. Everyone pretty much knows a lot of what you're going to do and you know what works. They know what works. And, um, you know, so you got to, I like to kind of look at maybe starting week five, week six, and kind of see what trends have emerged since then. And I talked about that in my uh, Ray Bonds review column over at 444, just looking at a couple of trends 
um, and seeing like what kind of emerged in October or, or later that that's kind of standing out. And, you know, for example, one thing, the Seahawks, uh, they, after their buy, they got even more pass heavy. They just kind of said, you know, here, Russell Wilson, just take our offense. We, we know we can't run the ball. We're going to play a, a satellite back more. We're going to play McKissick on the field more. And, and their pass rate went from like maybe I think it was about 57% up to 62%. Um, then you have a team like the Chiefs who for the first uh, month of the season, you know, teams – we're playing a lot of man coverage against them. Andy Reid knew exactly how to beat man coverage. He had all these pre-snap motions and Tyreek Hill, just a lot of deception. And that was screwing with defense's man coverage schemes. So we, I believe it was six or seven. Whenever they play Pittsburgh, um, Pittsburgh is a very zone-heavy team, just naturally. I think they play about 90% zone, um, no matter who they're facing. So Pittsburgh plays zone all game shuts down Kansas City's offense and every team but the Raiders really because their defense is abysmal has been able to use that as a blueprint to stop the Chiefs so um, you know that that was kind of a big thing and Travis Kelsey even came out and admitted it I think it was last week he said we can't we can't beat cover two until we beat that cover two uh, defenses are going to keep throwing it at us so I'm um, just kind of understanding the real football aspects of these things and you know reading a couple of beat writer reports, you know, anytime you see like a source, like go to four for four, you might see a news item or road or wherever, see a news item. Like you can follow that source on Twitter or whatever. And kind of the beat writers during the season, they have the, a pulse on the team. So you could kind of see, you know, what the coaches and the coordinators are saying in practice. Even the players sometimes give you some helpful tidbits. Like when, when, when they kind of confirm something you might've been suspecting. Uh, so I think that that's just really important. It's, it's not necessarily just, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a specific, trend or number that you can look at and say oh this is how this is how I, I I know that this is happening or this team is changing you just got to do it on a case-by-case -case basis and think about it more from a real football perspective as well not just you know DFS or betting yeah good stuff there uh, great tips from Warren and Chris as far as adjusting your thinking on these teams as the season progresses uh, the season is you know there's seasons within the season I think uh, Evan Silva put it uh, earlier this week on Rotor Grinders so you want to make sure that you're keeping up to speed with how these teams are changing, how personnel is changing, and ultimately we're using this to try to better predict the flow of these games and the outcomes of these games based on a total perspective, uh, which ultimately help us if we're betting and also in DFS. Now, speaking of taking a look at the week's games and trying to figure out the totals, uh, Warren, we've only got, once again, one significantly high total game this week with the Rams and New Orleans. Uh, plenty of low total games as usual. Uh, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Carolina, the Jets, uh, Jacksonville, Arizona, Houston, and Baltimore. When you take a look at the landscape of the games this week, uh, which of these games has stood out to you as one that could exceed the total and that we could potentially take advantage of here in DFS? Um, the one that I've been looking at, again, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with the total that was posted. I don't look at these games and say, well, this game is, is total of a high number, um, and so therefore I think there's going to be a lot of fantasy points. The way I think that you're going to find value is targeting the games that you think are going to go over the total. And one that had actually a low total to start the week and is still low comparatively, but is, has creep, crept up there a little bit, is Seattle, San Francisco. Um, some spots open at 43, others a little bit below that. That's now 44 and a half, 45. And that's one of the games that I got involved in. Uh, we went over 43 in that one. And I think that there's a lot of opportunities for success. Number one, you've got both of these teams are two of the fastest paced teams in the NFL. Um, you've got the San Francisco 49ers that are coming off of a bye week. And I think in some cases I've done some research into this because bye weeks tend to throw some teams off. So I looked at specifically, was there anything that these teams had in common with, with one another uh, where they were getting rattled by bye weeks? And generally what I was finding specifically – this season, and I didn't take the study back in prior years yet, but what I was finding was that really good offensive teams that have strong offenses that really know what they're doing go on a bye week and they come back, and a lot of times either they implement a little bit of a wrinkle or they just haven't – they've gotten out of that rhythm that they're usually accustomed to because bye weeks obviously do take a little bit of a toll on anybody. They come back, they're just not in that same game rhythm. Um, when they experience like a little bit of a jagged or rough start, they can get derailed a little bit in that game. Uh, but what I found is that teams with m mediocre to poor offenses in general that go on bye weeks don't really suffer the same impediments coming out of those bye weeks because they're already accustomed to having issues 
uh, and what they might have done during the bye week is worked on some things that are really going to make a difference. Like a really good offense is it going to be like, well, we've got to overhaul this and really focus on getting it to this guy instead. And th- Good teams aren't doing anything like that. They're just like, okay, more of the same, let's keep it going. But the bad teams are really trying to overhaul things, and and it sometimes catches the other team off guard a little bit. Uh, So I don't think we're going to run into any type of issues with the San Francisco 49ers um, like we would have some other teams. Now, granted, this team has only put up 10 points in three of their last four games before they had a nice 31-point performance against the Giants last week. But um, it is a team that – could be a little bit more erratic, but I like the fact that they had that bye week. It gives the quarterback extra time. Remember, he was not the starter to start the season. He gets a full week of getting more, you know, extra time to think about and study the offense mentally. And then, of course, the practice this past week. Now, personally, I would be looking to get Garoppolo in there if I was running the 40 hours. I, I know that they say C.J. Beathard has earned this and that sort of thing, but I mean, let's be realistic here for a second. C.J. Beathard is not the future of this team, having just traded high picks to get Jimmy Garoppolo. He is the future, and you're going up against a Seattle defense that's really beaten up. I mean, completely torn up. Yes, the Atlanta Falcons have a good offense, and yes, they were able to have a ton of success last week, scoring 34 points and winning up in Seattle, but you'd be hard-pressed to tell me that Jimmy Garoppolo wouldn't have a lot of success throwing the ball to the secondary. One of the surprising things about the Seahawks' defense is their inability to get pressure on the quarterback. They basically rank league average. They have not been doing a very good job at pressuring the opposing quarterback, and one of the things that I think could potentially hurt them even more in this matchup is with all the injuries to the secondary, you'll have more opportunities for receivers to get open earlier in the routes in this game. Um, You don't have like uh, Sherman playing tight press coverage and you don't have the threat of Cam Chancellor coming up and you don't, there's just worse talent in that secondary who can't play quite as well in terms of coverage. So I think you're going to have routes that are going to open up even faster for the quarterback to get the ball out of his hands. But regardless of discussing things that aren't happening, which is Jimmy Garoppolo, I still think that Beathard is going to be able to have a lot of success in this matchup. And then we haven't even discussed, you know, the other side of the ball, who's really going to be pulling the cart in this game. And that's the Seattle Seahawks. I mean, they're favored on the road by basically six and a half to seven points here. Um, The only reason why they're not favored by more is because of these injuries to their defense. I mean, this offense, it's one-dimensional. They're a pass-heavy offense. Russell Wilson is doing everything for this team. But they are going up against one of the easiest defenses that they'll face of the entire season. The 49ers themselves have been ravaged by injuries. Uh, A guy that Chris uh, Rabon has mentioned a few times, Jaquiski Tart, he is obviously not there. That's opened up things for the opposing tight end. We've seen how much Jimmy Graham has gotten involved as a tight end with the Seahawks the last several weeks, particularly inside of the red zone, uh, a massive threat for them to walk away with sevens as opposed to threes, thanks to their involving Jimmy Graham down in that part of the field and scheming more of the offense for him. Um, I just think that we're going to see a little bit more of an open game. And the great thing about this one is if you're the San Francisco 49ers and you have lost that game and you are now 0-10, let's say, and you're heading into this game off your bye week, what I would be expecting for a team who does not want to go 0-16 is a really conservative effort not to lose this game and to come out a little bit more strategic, try to play really good defense, and then when you get down, obviously you get forced into something. Here, they don't have that burden, that millstone around their neck of, well, we could go 0-16, we've really got to make sure we win this game. They can come out and just run Kyle Shanahan's offense and have fun, open things up, try to impress the home crowd. Um, you know, I don't think that there's anything that that – threat of going 0-16 is now gone for this team, and I don't see any reason why they're not going to play a little bit more open and, uh, you know, effectively on offense without that concern. So I think both sides of the ball have some opportunities here. I don't think this is necessarily isolated to, um, you know, only playing your Seattle Seahawks. You used to be able to do – you used to have to do that when Seattle was playing the 49ers and Seattle had that imposing defense. But I'm thinking that that, this defense – is not all that imposing. And if you can find some lower priced guys uh, from the 49ers, considering they're going to be running a faster paced offense and Seattle's going to be passing the ball a lot themselves, that's going to be able to open up some, some production for the 49ers. Yeah. Doug Baldwin, Jimmy Graham, even Russell Wilson, to some extent, a little bit more expensive and pricey on the DFS sites. So if you are going to correlate this game and come back with some 49ers, it could 
uh, make it a little bit easier on the rest of your roster. Good stuff there on that game. Do like that game myself, Chris. Uh, when you take a look at a game that you think the total might be off on, where else are you looking in the National Football League? Yeah, I think this Tennessee-Indianapolis game it features two bad defenses, and I think the total – um, could definitely go over there. I know that Rashard Matthews is looking a little iffy for the Tennessee Titans, but the Titans don't really necessarily um, rely on any one player, especially a guy like Rashard Matthews. Um, they can just kind of – they have Corey Davis now. They can kind of just throw Eric Decker on the other side and put Taewon Taylor in the slot. They've been going heavier with uh, Delaney Walker and Jonu Smith, so they have two good tight ends that they can kind of throw out there. They're, they're a deep offense, and this Indianapolis defense still not very – uh, good. They have, they're the only team uh, defense, I believe, in the league. If you check uh, sharpfootballstats.com, actually, um, they're the only defense in the league that's allowing at least seven and a half yards per attempt to running backs, wide receivers, and tight ends. Um, they allow 8.3 yards per attempt on the season. That's most in the National Football League. So I think, you know, this is one of those situations where when you're trying to find those va that value and those totals that are going to go over in, in kind of, you know, weird places, then you kind of want to look at team, games with teams with two bad defenses because what that's going to do is, you know, that could kind of create some correlation there where um, if one team kind of get, gets out to scoring, um, the, the other team is more likely to come back and force it into a shootout. Sometimes it happens with good offenses, but it can also happen with good defense, um, excuse me, bad defenses. And, um, you know, on the other side of the ball, I mean, this, this Tennessee defense isn't uh, very good either. We saw Pittsburgh did to them, um, Indianapolis at home, T.Y. Hilton, much better splits at home in the Dome. He, he's probably going to see a lot of a Dory Jackson. So, you know, that's a matchup I think he can win. And, uh, you know, you're going to have Jack Doyle here. He's always going to be that underneath target. We saw Chester Rogers kind of come, come alive a little bit in the last game, taking over for Kamar Aiken. That's allowed T.Y. Hilton to get into the slot more, which is also going to help him kind of uh, avoid some coverages and, and uh, get open a little bit more, I think, because he's going to be able to move around a bit more. He was playing a lot more on the outside earlier in the season, which he wasn't doing as much of last year when he had that big year. So uh, I just think both offenses, uh, you know, are in pretty decent spots here. And you have a situation where we talked about this before, but aside from Hilton, all the players involved in this game are pretty inexpensive. So you can really kind of leverage that, create some game stacks and some correlations there. And you're not really burning through a big portion of your salary cap. Yeah, it looks like Indianapolis uh, not very good at preventing explosive plays. Uh, I think there could be some ways you could take advantage of that on the Tennessee side of the ball here. Uh, a game that I think we could look to uh, from multiple angles here. So all in all, two good games for us to be targeting where the games could go over the total. Now, as far as big favorites, maybe, maybe favorites that uh, we don't think should be favorites, Warren, is anyone that you've taken a look at on this week's schedule where – uh, we could be potentially looking at something that's off about the spread. Um, well, I know that Chris is going to dig, dig into a little bit more detail on this one, so I'll just kind of just touch on it really briefly. Um, I just think it's a really bad matchup for uh, for the Arizona Cardinals here. Arizona wants to try to run the football, and this Jacksonville run defense has gotten tremendously better the last several games after making the trade with Buffalo. Um, they're just a much better run stopping unit. And I think that that's going to cause a ton of problems for the Arizona Cardinals rushing offense here. And then, you know, Arizona passing into this defense, look, they're, I just think that they're going to struggle from that perspective as well. And I don't know John Brown's status or not, but, um, I, I think that they're going to have some trouble doing that. Obviously Larry Fitzgerald is their number one, their number one target and they throw the ball to him a ton, but, um, I think then you look at the flip side, you know, Jacksonville can have some success offensively here. Um, I think that they have the opportunity to be balanced. And we've seen what the Arizona Cardinals, since they've had some injuries to their secondary, what they've given up offensively, um, you know, in terms of production to the wide receivers. This is a team that uh, just last week made, you know, the Houston Texans look tremendous. I mean, I've been talking for a while now about how bad this Houston Texans offense is and, uh, you know, they lost Tyvon Branch. They allowed Tom Savage 69% completions, 55% success rate, and a 97 passer rating. I mean, those are horrendous statistics to allow to Tom Savage. Um, I don't care where the game is being played. And 
Uh, there's no doubt about it to me, Blake Bortles is much better than Tom Savage, and that's saying something. Um, I think that with the balance that Jacksonville is going to have offensively, they should be able to do enough on offense. And then with the defense playing against some of the strengths of what the Arizona Cardinals want to do, and, and people just need to keep in mind, what, this is why we talk about you know trending performance. Um, Marcel Darius coming there and really – creating such a better situation on the ground for their run defense. If you look at full season stats, you're going to think that, you know, the Jaguars probably going to give up some production to uh, Adrian Peterson. But if you look at the trending performance with Marcel Darius in there, that's when you're going to realize, Hey, that's not actually a good matchup for the Arizona Cardinals to attack. So uh, let, let's toss it over, I guess, Chris and see what else he has to say on this game. But I, I think it's just a matchup problem for the Arizona Cardinals here. Yeah, Chris, so, so what about here? We've got, you know, Ramsey looks like he's not going to play per his words. Uh, looks like uh, Marquis Lee might be out for the Jaguars. But, you know, we could say the same thing about the Arizona side of the ball. You know, John Brown probably going to miss the game, certainly missing their starting quarterback. Uh, lots of issues over there on the Arizona side, too. How do you see this matchup, and why do you think that this game is still going to be off? I just think, you know, as, as Warren alluded to, the Jaguars, I mean – their every position on defense, save for maybe that cornerback spot without Ramsey, but you know everywhere on their like it's not even about their cornerback. It's about their it's about their front seven and Arizona's front um, offensive line is very very poor. Um, if you if you look at their Pro Football Focus ratings, they have no offensive linemen starting with a, a grade over a fifty two point seven, and that's out of a hundred. Meanwhile, the Jaguars front seven everyone is, is graded above uh, 77.8. So, you know, that's just a mismatch. I don't – I think that the Jaguars, you know, they, they've scored 20 uh, fantasy points four separate times this season, the Jaguars' defense. And that is more than all but six other players on the, on the DraftKings slate. So, I mean, you're, you're looking for upside, and there's like six or seven home – large home favorites, and there's just a lot of large favorites on the slate – and the Jaguars are the most expensive one. So that being said, I don't think their ownership is really going to be, um, you know, commensurate with what they, their upside is. And this is a kind of a tough slate in a way where there's not really any gimme, gimme plays, at least not as we speak right now, where they're just, you know, guaranteed to hit value at a real world price. So, I mean, yeah, the Jaguars are 41 uh, on DraftKings, for example, but they have that 20-point upside that – there's not, you know, out of all the the players in that salary range, the Jags D might have like might have to be the most likely to hit 20 points than any of you know the other players you might find at even a position like receiver or running back or something like that. So I really think that uh, you got to give consideration, even though they're the most expensive defense and it's kind of a tight slate. Um, I think you have to give consideration to paying up for that Jaguars defense, and then on the other side of the ball. I think Leonard Fournette is somebody that's probably going to go a little bit overlooked um, just because th there's other running backs that have kind of been, been, been killing it a little more lately. You know, the Saints running backs, Kamara and Ingram. You got Gurley in a smash spot. And you got Kareem Hunt in a really good matchup. I think people are still going to want to attack that as well. And so I don't, I don't really hear too many people talking about Fournette right now, but I think stacking him with the Jags defense is – quite interesting. You probably get him at, at, at pretty low ownership compared to the other stud backs. And then you mentioned Marquise Lee being banged up and D.D. Westbrook came back last week, preseason leader in receiving yards and a player who dropped in the draft mostly due to off field concerns. But they said he had first, second round talent. And in his first game back, he, 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 had, he only had six targets, but he had 40% of the team's air yards. And when you're looking for upside and you're looking for those two things, you're looking for talent and you're looking for a player that, you know, at that price, if, if he gets a, a big play, a, a splash play and an explosive play um, at, at that price, he's going to be very close to paying it off. Even if it's just like one, one play. So I think that's another player that you, you have to consider sitting there at, at 3,600 on DraftKings. And um, I think he's 4,900, I believe on FanDuel or something like that. So, um, I think I just think the Jaguars, you know, going against Blaine Gabbert too, you know, with a terrible offensive line and a running game that they're likely to just snuff out. I mean, they've been snuffing out running games every week now, um, as Warren mentioned. I just I don't see how 
uh, the Cardinals keep it within whatever the spread is right now, five, five and a half points. I think that's still a stretch, even with somebody like Ramsey or Lee out. Uh, some good insight there as far as how to think about the flow of this game, how this game might project to go from an, a real life NFL standpoint. And you can obviously tell a story with your DFS lamps as to how that would benefit the players in the game. Obviously, Chris mentioned there are, you know, depending on what your definition is of a significant favor, like nine to 11 significant favorites on this slate. So, you know, really coming to terms and coming to, you know, your sense of how that game is going to go and really making your DFS lineups tell that story is going to be important to your success here in week number 12. When it comes to the offensive side of the ball, Chris, I know you've taken a look at this week and you've kind of come up with something you want to break down for us when it comes to analytics. Uh, where are you turning as far as an offensive recommendation in week 12? I think you really have to look at uh, Cooper Cup the slot receiver, rookie slot receiver for the Los Angeles Rams going up against the New Orleans Saints defense in a game with the highest over-under of the week. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. And the, the first is that Jared Goff's most trusted target, Robert Woods, is going to miss this game with a shoulder injury. Coming out of the bye, they played three games. And the first game out of the bye, they, they had that smash against the Giants. Robert Woods scores two touchdowns. Um, and in the two games after that, Robert Woods has his uh, two most highly targeted games of the year. He's in double-digit targets in both of those games. So in the three games after the bye, Robert Woods, 27% of Jared Goff's targets. And he, he's the team leader on the year as well. But 27% over a quarter of his targets over those last three games, that's going to be out. And I was tweeting about this a little earlier today, but – uh, Greg Cosell of NFL Films, he watches the All-22 and really, really dives deep and kind of breaks it down. He kind of relayed a little tidbit that, you know, his, his, he was actually talking about Sammy Watkins running wide open um, and Jared Goff not throwing him the ball. But what I found interesting about that was he said it, it was because God, the, the way the Rams uh, line up, they're – Sammy Watkins is the ex ISO receiver. So he's isolated on the weak side of the formation. And then there's usually, you know, Woods it used to be, and then cup in the slot and then a tight end and Goff would have kind of a three man read to that side. And that would kind of be his progression on every play. And I think Robert Woods was, was, was benefiting from that the most, but now you have a situation where Robert Woods is out. I think you're going to see Cooper cup kind of benefit from that. You know, he's going to kind of be Goff's, first read on a lot of these plays and you know Cooper Cup has he's already had a lot of success this season he he's, should have a good matchup in the slot the Saints usually play a, a safety Kenny Vaccaro in the slot in coverage he's actually ranked a uh, 109th of all safeties in in uh, PFF's coverage grades he has struggled in coverage for most of this season so uh, you know there's a, in a game that has a really high potential of shooting out I mean it's a 50 plus spread, close spread. It's under three points as we are recording this. Um, there's just a lot to like about Cup. I think he could kind of be that target monster from the slot and put up a lot of volume. And it's, he also has touchdown upside, even though he's like a slot receiver. You don't really think of slot receivers in that way. Cooper Cup, in terms of red zone targets, is actually fourth in the league with 16 red zone targets, 31% of Los Angeles's red zone target market share. So really a lot to like about Cup, and it's tough to imagine him really not having a good enough game to pay off his salary, which is very affordable on uh, both of the main sites. Yeah, I, that whole offense in general is going to be in a pretty good situation in this game, and Cup's certainly going to be one that stands to benefit from both the injury situation on his side of the ball and also the opponent's side of the ball. Uh, looking pretty good for Cup here. Warren, when you take a look at someone from an advanced analytics standpoint you think might benefit in week number 12, where have you landed? Um, I've landed on uh, a guy that we kind of just discussed uh, in the game that Chris was talking about before, but this this is like a audible that I'm calling here. Um, not talking about the guy that I was planning on discussing. Instead, I'm going to talk about Corey Davis because – um, if Rashard Matthews is indeed out and he apparently hurt himself on practice yesterday, did not practice today, that's a horrible sign uh, heading forward towards a game in a couple of days. So I think it's probably unlikely. Now, if he goes, this analysis completely changes. But if he does not go, um, I think Corey Davis is in a massively great spot here. One of the things that I like to look at is um, 
recent performance, uh, not just recent performance, but who have you been doing this recent performance against? And if we look at what Corey Davis has been doing in terms of his last few games, uh, five, 10, and then seven targets the last three weeks. Now his reception totals haven't been high. There's been near touchdowns that he fumbled out by hitting the pylon, you know, and just barely going over the uh, goal line without carrying the football in. But if you look at who they played, like the explosive pass defenses, they're literally have just played, I mean, the entire AFC North in four consecutive weeks with a bye week in between. They played the Browns, the Ravens, the Bengals, and the Steelers. Now, the Bang, uh, the Ravens, Bengals, and Steelers rank 14th, 8th, and 10th in explosive pass defense. They just don't allow very many explosive passes against them. And the Indianapolis Colts, get they get to play them. In a dome, all these games obviously have been outdoors. Last week they just played up in Pittsburgh at night. They get to play in a dome in a day game against the Indianapolis Colts, who ranked dead last in the NFL in explosive pass defense. If you look at um, – and Chris mentioned you know, some, some benefits for the Indianapolis Colts offense here as well, and I fully agree that there's going to be points from the Indianapolis offense in this game. So it's not going to be this game where the Titans get up 20-3 to three and just run the rock the rest of the game. I mean, they're going to be – passing the football uh, the entire game. And if you look at uh, specifically Rashard Matthews in his absence, let's, again, we're forecasting this to occur. We don't know if it is or not. But there's basically been two main deep targets aside from Ray Davis for the Tennessee Titans the last three weeks, Rashard Matthews and Delaney Walker. Um, if you're taking out Rashard Matthews from the mix, and obviously that's going to mean that in your – number one and number two wide receiver sets, you're going to have Corey Davis and Eric Decker. We all pretty much know what Eric Decker is not going to be doing. This guy is not a deep ball, deep route runner. He rarely runs deep routes. He rarely catches balls deep. Uh, the guy who's going to have a big uptick, I think, from a target rate down the field is going to be Corey Davis. Now, he already, he's been targeted five times and passes 15 yards or more in the last three weeks. Um, it's, it's definitely a little bit below Rashard Matthews, who was targeted eight times. But if he gets some of those targets, he has a ton of short targets, specifically short left, um, where there's some uh, issues with the Indianapolis Colts defense. I think that there's going to be a lot of upside for him. I think the volume is certainly going to be there. He's priced, at least on FanDuel, the same rate as which uh, Cooper Cup is, who uh, Chris just talked about before benefiting from another positive situation thanks to an injury, unfortunately, for the Rams. So I think you got another situation where Tennessee Titans, they've got to win this game to stay in the hunt after dropping that game. They went, they could have been seven and three uh, through their first 10 games. They're now six and four. They can't afford to lose this game to drop to six and five. We know that their defense has issues. It's going to be on their offense. I think they're going to try to run the football, of course, but the, if you're looking at what's the easiest way to beat the Colts, it's through the air right now, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities to pass the ball specifically uh, to Corey Davis. Uh, Mariota, Delaney Walker, Corey Davis, all these guys are too good to be underperforming for the entire season the way that they have, as far as I can tell from what I've seen over their careers and over the recent uh, you know, performances here in the National Football League. So certainly Corey Davis is someone going to benefit for sure from the injuries. And you also did drop Delaney Walker in there at one point. I mean, I'm just sort of looking at this as something we definitely have to pay attention to for DFS coming up on Sunday. Chris, when we turn our focus to the defensive side of the ball, uh, trying to evaluate matchups that can either benefit us or potentially maybe we want to stay away from, what have you kind of researched over the last couple of days here and found for our purposes in DFS? Yeah, let's go back to that Seattle-San Francisco game because, uh, you know, I think one player that, you know, you know, we mentioned Warren mentioned the the San Francisco passing game, and I think that's uh, very astute because Carlos Hyde, I think, ha is going to have a tough go this week. Now, I know he's kind of priced in a spot where, especially on DraftKings, you kind of feel like, hey, you know, he's he's going to get some volume. He's at home. You know, maybe I just roll him out there and hope for the best. But I think that's kind of a really risky move because. We know what kind of stats Adrian Peterson's been putting up lately. We saw him on, on the national TV game, 21 carries for 29 yards against the Seattle front. But what's crazy is starting in week eight, um, they, they've made every running back look like Adrian Peterson. I mean, Lamar Miller had 21 carries for 54 yards in week eight. 
in week nine, Rob Kelly had 14 carries for 18 yards. Then the next week, Peterson goes 21 carries, only 29 yards. And on Monday night last week, Kevin Coleman, 20 carries, and he gains only 43 yards. So this is not a positive situation at all for Carlos Hyde. And then if you look at what's how Seattle has been able to defend running backs out of the backfield, they're one of only four teams that uh, allows five yards per target or fewer to the position. Um, they're third in success rate uh, to, on passes to the running back. So, and, and Carlos Hyde also saw his target share decline a little bit um, going into the, the buy after we kind of expected him to have a lot of targets. He had, Four straight games with six targets or more going into that game against the Giants. Had only three targets in that game. So we don't exactly know what his role is going to be in the passing game moving forward. We don't know what's going to happen with Matt Breida coming out of the bye. There's all these new pass catch. Just a lot of moving parts uh, for this uh, 49ers team. And I think their passing game, as Warren alluded to, probably has the better matchup in this game. And, uh, you know, Kyle Shanahan, smart guy, good offensive mind. I don't see him – trying to just stuff it down to Seattle's throat after after these last four weeks of performances by Seattle where they're holding running backs to, to two and sometimes even uh, one yard per carry. So, you know, going back to that, that Tennessee-Indianapolis uh, game, you know, a pivot, you know, if you're pivoting off Carlos Hyde and you need somebody in that range, I mean, don't forget about DeMarco Murray. He's playing 80% of the snaps. And we know Tennessee's going to run the ball too. Colts 27th in Schedule adjusted fancy points allowed to the running back position. Henry Anderson, one of uh, a key player on their front seven, has gone down. So, uh, you know, Marco Murray is another guy where, you know, if you're trying to get off Carlos Hyde in a, in a tough matchup, you know, the, the Colts are, are, are 29th in success rate on running back passes. They're allowing 8.4 yards per target to the position, and that is dead last in the league. So, um, you know, I think Carlos Hyde's in a tough matchup, but you might want to kind of pivot away from that. I think Carlos Hyde's price point and projectable workload on DraftKings is going to lead to him being somewhat popular as an option on that particular site. And I don't think that he'll be unpopular on FanDuel either. So uh, if you're correct, Chris, that could be a point uh, of potential leverage in GPP tournaments if you find a viable pivot or maybe build your construction a little bit differently than saving at that second or third running back spot as you would do there with Carlos Hyde. Warren, when you take a look at the defensive side of the ball and some analytics that could benefit us this week, anything interesting to share? Uh, well, I'll keep this one simple. Um, if you're looking at, you know, defenses this week, I think the Pittsburgh Steelers are interesting because um, if you look at who they've gone up against with bad pass uh, protection, they really haven't faced a ton of teams this year whose pass protection has been really bad. But the Green Bay Packers' pass protection has been really bad. Now, unfortunately for Green Bay, they faced two of their prior opponents were really good at getting after the quarterback as well in uh, Baltimore last week and Chicago the week before that. Um, but when you're taking into account, you know, how are you going to get production defensively? Um, you want pass protection. You want – sorry, you want a pass rush defensively. I think we're going to uh, see that situation here. Um, you've got Brett Helmley going on the road to play Pittsburgh. Um, they played – a couple of games at home since he's been starting for them. The lone game that they played on the road was in Chicago uh, against a bad quarterback, against a bad offense in general. I mean, I've liked the Bears this season in terms of what they've been able to do and, and cover some games for me. But, um, you know, Mitch Trubisky and, and this offense certainly isn't a great offense. And if you can shut down the run game, that's going to go a long way. And, and Green Bay had some success doing that. But getting back to this week's game, um, I have a feeling like – they're going to be – if you look at what Brett Hanley has done, he started against New Orleans, that was at home. Started against the Detroit Lions, that was at home. Started last week against the uh, Baltimore Ravens, that was at home. And the only road game in his four was in Chicago. And like we said, they had a good they, – they got off to a small lead. They played well. Here they're 14-point underdogs. That's probably not going to happen. They're playing on the road in Pittsburgh in prime time. Uh, the Steelers, up and down team, I'm not saying take the Steelers and lay the 14 points by any stretch. What I am saying is that I think it's going to be a situation where Brett Hundley is going to have to drop back, is going to have to pass the ball here a fair amount, is going to give opportunities for the Pittsburgh Steelers pass rush to have some success, is going to give opportunities for ball hawking defense to try to make some interceptions. So I just think it's a difficult matchup for the passing game of the Green Bay Packers offensively in a game where they probably will have to pass a lot in one of Brett Hundley's really – 
true road games where they're traveling somewhere apart from like a divisional opponent and they're going to be playing in a hostile environment in prime time. Um, so I, I think that there's no, not that any of you were going to play Brett Hundley or play some of the wide receivers necessarily, but I do think that for the defensive perspective that Pittsburgh is an intriguing um, play from that perspective. It looks like they're going to be under 5k on FanDuel this week. So pretty happy to get them involved in your action, especially in multi uh, entry tournaments here, certainly not a really good spot here for the Green Bay Packers. Um, various reasons that Warren just mentioned that you might want to consider the Steelers defense. Looking at the chalk this week, Chris, we talked about a couple of these guys already. We talked about Russell Wilson uh, in a great spot this week. I think he'll be popular on DFS sites. I think we're going to see a lot of Todd Gurley, Kareem Hunt, Julio Jones, A.J. Green. I think we'll see a little bit of that Jags defense you talked about earlier as a play that people are going to want to play. When you take a look at the chalk, you know, where have you kind of landed when it comes to Russell Wilson? How are you going to utilize him this week? I mean, the thing about Russell Wilson that's so crazy, and I think I've said it on this podcast before, or I've said it in other places I know, like for fantasy purposes, like to me, he's he's Aaron Rodgers at this point. Because, you know, remember when Aaron Rodgers didn't have a running game and they just essentially put it in – you know his hands and he would just throw and you know he would be throwing short passes and long passes and and, you know it's just he's running a little bit and it's this is what Russell Wilson has become I mentioned that Seattle is passing more than ever Um, they kind of raised their pass rate over 60 percent they're not usually in that range but they've been there pretty consistently since the uh, bye and you know the amazing thing about Russell Wilson I mean 83 percent of Seattle's offensive yardage has he has accounted for he you know is their leading rusher and their leading passer, obviously. So it's, it's, you know, this San Francisco 49ers defense is not very good, you know, at all. And this is just a spot where Russell Wilson has actually outscored since, since the Seahawks by in week six, he's outscored every other quarterback in fantasy on DraftKings by uh, five points and, and, and on, no, on DraftKings by six points per game. And on FanDuel by five points per game, um, ex- ex- excluding Deshaun Watson, who played like one game uh, during that span. But it, Russell Wilson has essentially been the most valuable player in fantasy since his team's bye. And I do not expect that um, to, to stop this week. San Francisco 20th in schedule adjusted fantasy points allowed to the quarterback position. San Francisco probably more relevant, um, tw- tied for 30th in uh, offensive schedule adjusted fantasy points out as a whole. So, you know, two entire offenses. I mean, Russell Wilson essentially is their entire offense in Seattle. So this guy, I think, is really in a good spot. I think he's cash viable, um, even though he's on the road. And um, one other player I, I thought I wanted to mention that's Chalk is A.J. Green. I think it's a really interesting matchup for him. We already know that anytime he steps on the field, he's going to have a really high ceiling. He's A.J. Green. But I think the floor is a little bit lower than maybe his ownership is going to suggest. And that's because it's Cleveland, they have actually used Jason McCourty, their cornerback, in shadow coverage a few times this season. And one of those times was actually against A.J. Green when these teams met for the first time uh, back in week four. And A.J. Green, had a, a he finished with a decent stat line, five catches, uh, 60 seven yards and a and a or 63 yards and a touchdown but he only caught a couple like two passes on on McCourty and his touchdown kind of came where they got him in a slot and he was matched up on Jabril Peppers and he scored that way but um, if if they if the, he doesn't get kind of that mismatch if they if they're not able to kind of get him free him up in the slot a little bit um, this could be one, a down game for him or he could have a low floor so at that ownership, I think you have to be a little bit careful, especially in tournaments where uh, salary is going to be tough to come by. Uh, you might want to try to have a little more balanced uh, roster construction, perhaps at wide receiver, because there is some kind of hidden risk with AJ Green. Even though you know it kind of looks like AJ Green Browns, you know it's a you know easy matchup for him. The Browns actually have not allowed 300 yards passing this season at all. So, you know, yeah, they're not a great pass defense, but they do tend to keep two of their safeties back deep. So you're not necessarily going to get like one of those 70 yard AJ green, you know, over the head, over somebody's head touchdown passes in this game. It's going to really kind of come down to how uh, Bill Lazor can scheme him open, maybe get him in a slot. And and that's not necessarily 
um, you know, what, 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 what he's usually successful at and when he usually has a smash spot. So I, I think that's something to keep in mind as far as the chalk goes at wide receiver. If you're interested in a chalkier Bengals player that you might be able to use to greater success, why don't you look at the tight end flow chart that's presented, presented to you by the Cleveland Browns. Uh, looks like they're 30th in pass success rate to the tight end position. Uh, they are targeted just about as much as anyone in the league at that position, according to sharpfootballstats.com. And, of course, doesn't hurt that Croft had a massive game against them earlier in the season. Now, Warren, when you take a look at the chalk here and some guys you think we might be able to leverage, uh, what sort of analytics and information have you brought to the table here for this week? Well, first of all, I love Russell Wilson as well. Um, that, would be, that would be the guy for me. Uh, but to uh, throw out another guy – that I think is just worth discussing, but the only reason why I'm not like jumping up and down and pounding the table for this guy is I just don't know what the hell Andy Reid is doing. And, and, and that is a running back from uh, Kansas City. I mean, Kareem Hunt, look, last week they were playing the New, the New York Giants. It was a little bit windy up there. Uh, Alex Smith couldn't push the ball down the field quite as much. Yet for whatever reason, this team still passed the ball 59% of the time, yet their success rates – were 52% when they ran the ball and 43% when they passed the ball. And Kareem Hunt himself averaged 4.1 yards per carry, which isn't necessarily great, but uh, for whatever reason, they were throwing the ball a lot. This run game, they've got all of their linemen healthy now. They were having, we, we talked about it, you know, at the, not necessarily the start of the season, but within like weeks five, six, seven, how they were dealing with some injuries along that offensive line and when were they going to get Dietrich Smith back and, they finally have these guys and they're healthy and they're playing yet they're not running the ball very well. And I don't really know what the hell is going on with Kareem Hunt and Andy Reid and the play calling and why it's not working and what they need to do differently. Um, but they sure as hell need to do something differently. And this is the week where you're playing at home. You're playing against the Buffalo bills. You're favored by like nine and a half to 10 points in this game. There's absolutely no reason with the way that the Buffalo Bills run defense has gotten trucked since Marcel Darius left to not run Kareem Hunt repeatedly against this team. I just don't know what's in Andy Reid's mind. Um, but that's what I would if, – if you think that you have a bead on what Andy Reid's going to do and you read some stuff taught and you spill some of his game plan on what he wants to do, then, then I would like Kareem Hunt here simply from the matchup that he's got going against him. But um, – you know, the, the productivity of recent weeks as well as the um, usage rate in we recent weeks has certainly not made me too enthusiastic about him um, at this point moving forward. But if there was a week where they're going to get him back on track, this would be the one. So we'll see. Russell Wilson's the guy who I think is kind of a really high floor dominant play this week. Uh, but Kareem Hunt, uh, unfortunately, with his price tag potentially – um, you're going to need him to deliver. And if he doesn't, you're, you're in trouble. And um, so he's less of a guy that I'm really in love with, but he's certainly got a great spot if they, if they get, get it back on track. Yeah, a lot of people might be a little bit concerned about his performance last week when he was the mega chalk. And this week he'll be not close to the mega chalk for that particular reason. But I still think that his situation is perhaps even slightly better than it was last week when, you, when it comes to matchup. And I, I certainly think that people – uh, should be taking him uh, to some degree in this week. It is tough. Pricing is tight on DFS sites, so if you're looking for a way to capitalize on that cream hunt, I think it's an excellent play. When it comes to guys that people aren't going to be talking about, Chris, uh, I know there's going to be more than a few this week. Like I said, pricing is tight, and there's going to be some guys that might be pretty good plays that aren't going to get that highly owned. Where have you kind of landed this week in that regard? Yeah, I think it's kind of a little out of left field. Um, I also talked about this on the DFS MVP podcast, but I like I like Corey Coleman um, against the Cincinnati Bengals. Now, I, I think that people are going to shy away because number one, it's a Brown, it's a Browns receiver. Number two, the Cincinnati Bengals have been uh, pretty good uh, against wide receivers. They have a solid all around defense, and they they tend to play good ball. But you know, when you're looking at Corey Coleman. And what he's done in, in the short amount of time that he's been on the field this season, I mean, he had uh, – in, in Deshaun Kaiser's first game, he had five catches uh, for, for, for over 50 yards and a touchdown against a pretty tough Pittsburgh defense. Um, then he kind of had a really rough game. The next game, only like one catch on, on seven targets. But then he, came, he comes back last week against the best secondary and the best defense, I would say, in the league this season. And he, he gets 11 targets and catches six balls 
for 80 yards. And I, I thought that was uh, impressive. And what's even more impressive about that is that he had 50%, half of the team's air yards. And again, you know, when you're, when you're in this kind of range of wide receivers, that low end salary range, if you can't get to a guaranteed kind of, or a high, higher floor volume guy, like maybe a Cooper cup, then what you're really looking for is a, an explosive guy. You know, when you find these wide receivers, it's like a Kenny Stills you know, last week where you, know, you, you don't always know what he's going to do target wise, but what you do know is that his targets are going to come down the field when they do come. We know you Jackson wants Deshaun Kaiser to throw down the field. And these are the kind of receivers I want to take chances on at that salary range. Just the guys that, you know, I don't, I don't expect, I don't want to have to rely on them. Now the volume is nice. Don't get me wrong with Corey Coleman, you know, 11 targets um, last week. You know, I, they don't really have any other pass catchers of note except Duke Johnson. So I think the volume will be there each and every week. But um, I think you really want, you don't want to necessarily rely on a receiver to um, repeatedly, you know, have catch balls against a great, a good secondary. But what you do want is, you know, have the opportunity for him to catch uh, explosive plays. And at that price, I think you really have to give a lot of consideration to Coleman when you consider his volume and his price. Like, yes, the matchup is bad, but he also has a lot of other things working in his favor. You know, Cincinnati is a big favorite over, over a touchdown favorite in this game. And we know Deshaun Kaiser isn't exactly shy about just forcing the ball down the field. So this could be a situation where Coleman could succeed just because of the normal volume he's getting, or he could just you know, ha tack on some garbage time stats. I, I, don't, I think there's a, you know, probably not as risky as it might seem uh, at first glance for Corey Coleman. So I like him a lot this week. Yeah. Excellent stuff there on the Browns and Corey Coleman. Uh, I'll just give a mini take here. I don't, I'm not sure exactly how far under the radar this guy is going to be, but if we're talking about nickel Roby Coleman being out, some shorthandedness in the Rams secondary. Uh, obviously, I think Michael Thomas is the guy people are going to turn to first, but it could be Ted Ginn time here in this matchup if he gets a little bit of Dominique Hatfield or something like that on the outside. You know, the Saints do move personnel around a lot, uh, try to get interesting matchups, could get one-on-one -on -one with Ginn for a couple of big shots down the field. I do think that it would probably be wise for the Saints to try to take more of a pass-heavy approach in this game as opposed to the normal run-heavy approach we've seen this season. I know they won't completely abandon that, and I don't expect them to be throwing it every single down. But I do think this is a situation where you can see Ted Ginn have a nice game here. And I don't think he'll be amongst the very uh, most popular plays on the slate. I'll be, I don't think he'll be like 2% or anything like that. Warren, where have you landed as far as under-the-radar plays for week number 12? Well, I, st I still like Corey Davis, um, definitely. But a guy that uh, Chris actually mentioned him in passing just now, um, and that would be Kenny Stills. If you look at uh, – assuming I think Jay Cutler is still in the concussion protocol, um, I just think he's going to have a lot of targets. Matt Moore loves to target this guy. And you look at the past defenses that they faced the last three weeks, let's say for Miami, they're coming off of a bye. The past defenses that they faced the last few weeks uh, – Carolina is the eighth best defense against the pass. Baltimore is, I think, the number two, one or two best defense against the pass. In the middle there, they had Oakland, and they really got some things going offensively against Oakland. Uh, that was, I believe, the prime time uh, Sunday night game. Um, the New England Patriots don't have a very good uh, pass defense. Even if you look at last week, uh, last week I just – I mean, it was bizarre what Oakland did there, how Oakland could not be more productive than eight points. But if you look at, like, their efficiencies and their success rates during the game, they were very successful in terms of uh, they posted a 55% success rate during the game offensively against this Patriots defense. Um, the problem for them came they punted the ball twice right around the New England 40-yard line or so, just, just around the 40. Uh, you can't do that, especially in Mexico City. And they drove the ball three times inside the New England 21-yard line, three times, and scored on only one of those three possessions. Obviously, you can't do that either. One, they uh, turned it over on downs. The other one, they fumbled the ball at like the six or seven-yard line. So uh, there's like four possessions right there that – you're playing against the Patriots. You've got to be a little bit more aggressive. And they completely botched it on those four possessions, not scoring on any of them, even though they had decent field position. Um, so I, I think that Kenny Stills offers a ton of upside. Uh, this is a team that's going to be trailing. They're like 16 and a half to seven point, 17 point 
underdogs up in New England. They're going to have plenty of opportunities to throw the ball. We already know that they like to throw the ball. Uh, they've Their run game really isn't as productive. It's devolved into more of a shorter passing offense, uh, which is just fine. That means uh, more time of possession. And, um, you know, the only, the only downside, the caveat here is that New England, we saw it against Oakland. They – they try to be explosive at times, but then they're also okay just being like a short passing ball possession type offense. And they might do that and chew up a bunch of clock here. I don't really think that there's any incentive for the Patriots to lay a big number here to, you know, win this game 40 to 17 or something like that. Like they, they just want to win this game and keep everybody healthy. Um, they, after what they did down in Mexico city, they, Trained. They played in Denver last week at altitude. They trained at the Air Force Academy, which is also at altitude for the entire week. Then they played in Mexico City. A lot of their players um, were very tired this past week. They were making public statements and, and some things that we've been reading about how exhausted they were. And, and it was just a difficult playing and, and staying at altitude for that long. So I am wondering, I mean, from a negative perspective, if they do slow it down, take it a little bit easier offensively and just try to win this game and get out of there, um, as it w- which would limit the amount of time and possessions that Miami would have. Uh, but in either case, um, I think Miami's going to have plenty of opportunities to throw the ball. I think Stills is a big beneficiary, and uh, his salary is such that you could, you could fit, him up, fit him in there pretty easily. Yeah, excellent stuff there, Warren. Kenny Stills certainly looking like a pretty good option here. And under the radar, of course, not going to be amongst the very highest owned plays on week number 12. So I encourage people to check out that take in their DFS rosters. Folks, that's going to do it for this week's edition of Sharp DFS Analysis. As a reminder, go to sharpfootballanalysis.com and sharpfootballstats.com for the best that Warren has to offer out there. If you want to check out what Chris Raybron has been doing lately, go to 4for4.com. Lots of great information and insight over there. And, of course, I'm Chris Jemina. You can find my stuff on Roto-Grinders Premium as well as all the guys here at Roto-Grinders. Uh, we're out there absolutely trying to help you get it done uh, in your DFS rosters. Best of luck in all your contests for Warren, for Chris. I'm Chris. We'll be back again next week.